From next week, a new era begins for Newcastle's late-night venues when clock-watching becomes part of the scene. Reports from police and residents of ongoing violence and antisocial behaviour prompted the licensing changes. From next Thursday morning, many venues have to close their doors by 3 o'clock with the serving of alcoholic drinks to stop half an hour beforehand. Patrons have to decide at 1am whether they're in or very definitely out when lockout commences. We see it as an important first step in making the city safe. The board has acted on the availability of alcoholic drinks with no shots to be served after 10pm and a limit of four drinks at a time. Council now wants fines increased for drinking in alcohol-free zones. At this stage it's about $22 which is ridiculous. It needs to be in the order of I believe $250 or maybe $300. Hotel and nightclub owners argue they're being blamed for the problems on the streets. There's a total lack of transport infrastructure, there's a total lack of policing of drinking in public places, there's a total lack of monitoring of people on the streets. The industry will lodge an appeal on Monday. Lucy Wilson, NBN News. They're on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and today was no exception for volunteer members of the Lake Macquarie Coastal Patrol. Grandfather and his uh, grandson out fishing. The motor wouldn't start in the boat, thought it was flat battery. We tried to jump start him, wouldn't start, so we towed him into blacksmiths. The service provides assistance on the lake and along the coastline between Redhead and Norahead with just one vessel for around 30 incidents a month. We've got our radios monitored all the time for any emergency. We look after everyone who needs us. The Coastal Patrol fundraiser at Pelican today aims to allow the purchase of a much needed, larger $150,000 rescue boat. We're patient. We're just hoping we get a little bit of help. Lucy Wilson, NBN News. The Hurricanes needed no reminding just what was at stake this afternoon at Lambton. In sixth spot and on the cusp of a semi-final spot, Hunter hosted Dremoyne, the team sitting just above them on the ladder. Hunter got the ball rolling with Mitchell Baird tipping in the opening score. But it was hard to stop Dremoyne from this sort of range. The Devils ghosting through some leaky defence to take the lead. Phil Reid went from long range but the Hurricane skipper was just as accurate. Although the visitors were coming up with the right plays, keeper Angus Crowley had his moments too. Dremoyne, though, continued to give the locals a devil of a time, showing more enterprise and attack. They pressed ahead to take the game 10-6 and leave Hunter's season sitting in a precarious position with only three games left. At the Broadmeadow Basketball Stadium, it's volleyball that's holding court with the opening round of the State Cup. Newcastle had a mixed start to their campaign on day one, losing their first match in the round-robin style competition before striking back later in the day to remain in the hunt for a final spot tomorrow. Among their ranks, former National Beach champion Paul Mounter. Sydney team Cedars remains the one to beat in the men's Division 1.
The shipping containers were brought in on Friday and residents, many of whom are members of the town's Parks and Reserves Committee, are furious it happened without consultation. They say the vandalised trees didn't block anyone's views and while they share Council's desire to protect the natives, containers aren't the answer. We were sure that had we been consulted, we could have come up with an alternative uh, decision, uh, for instance, to plant a hundred trees. We would have done it that day. Residents say the containers are council's way of pointing the finger at innocent people and they now fear for their safety. Already some of the neighbours have been getting hate mail. People have been actually stopping and sort of saying, nice view, mate. Worse than being ugly, residents say the structure is dangerous because it is unfenced. They have taken the swings away because of a public liability problem and at the edge of the park, on right on school holidays, they have put a climbing, an enormous illegal climbing structure. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. Saw my little pinky finger real short, short as there. I was like, oh, I think there's something wrong. And I turned it around and my bone was sticking out of my finger. A rising sun had barely lit up the Newcastle coastline and it was on. A record field meant staggered starts for the Newcastle triathlon but there was no stopping a working harbour which provided a moving backdrop of its own. The 500 metre swim is tougher than it sounds and Sydney's Tim Porter led the field out of transition for the 25k ride. On a revised cycle course, competitors had five laps to make their move Nathan Stewart needed just one, moving from fifth to first as he inched closer to a third straight title. But Porter pushed the hometown boy all the way. Halfway through the 10k run leg, he not only caught but passed Stewart. It wasn't until the final run for home that Stewart broke away again and crossed in a tick under one hour, five and a half minutes. In that run leg, Tim was relentless and then um, surprisingly I got him. I, I thought he did sad me for most of the run. but. Yeah, it's got up in the end. In the women's division, 16-year-old Steph Austin upstaged the open field to sprint home and take the title.
For many families, ageing photographs and an assortment of memorabilia are all they have to remember those who perished on HMAS Sydney. Among the descendants of the Sydney's victims is Bronwyn Bashford from ABC Radio Newcastle, whose grandfather was among the 645 sailors killed. She broke the news to her mother this morning that the warship's resting place has finally been found. It was a sense of disbelief. She's lived with this for 65 years. She was 12 when she lost her father and it really impacted on her life. Bronwyn now hopes the site where her grandfather, Warrant Officer John Albert Ernest Fuller, lies with the Sydney is left as a war grave to give families a sense of closure. There was no service, there was nothing to give those families closure and I think that this is a very important step towards families being able to, to take that step towards closure. Maitland's John Owens is the son of another Warrant Officer on the Sydney. He last saw his father Bill when he was aged five. John Owens believes the warship deserves honours of monumental proportions. They should raise it. A ship of that importance deserves a capital spot. But it's a lot of things, money and time. Gary Blair, NBN News. Newcastle hoteliers lodged an appeal this morning against the Liquor Administration Board's decision to shut venues by 3am and impose a 1am lockout. They're hoping trading will be allowed to continue as normal until the appeal is heard, which could be months away. Meantime, Newcastle City Council, Police, Newcastle Buses and City Rail met this morning to discuss the details of the new laws, in particular changes to the transport timetable. We have currently an 80% capacity on a Friday night and currently a 40% capacity on a Saturday night. So we really need to encourage people to use public transport and make sure that we have uh, buses in place uh, at the times that they're required. Also tabled the need for more police resources, security cameras and tougher penalties for those caught drinking in alcohol-free zones. There's currently a, a two warning uh, policy and then uh, a $23 fine if you're caught drinking in the streets. Uh, police are telling me that the fine needs to be higher. And Hunter Tourism has cautiously welcomed the changes, saying it's a wait and see situation. There may be some reduction in the number of people that are coming into the city uh, on weekends. By the same token, you know, we, we might see if, uh, if the level of safety increases, we may see more people. Lauren Bladwell. NBN News. A surfing pioneer of the 1960s and 70s, Robbie Wood was one of the first who dared to take on the treacherous Merriweather waves. He'd often have a young Mark Richards in tow. Rob gave me tremendous sort of confidence and coaching in, in surfing there and also in sort of pushing me into surfing bigger surf, which was, you know, was partly responsible for my competitive success in Hawaii in years to come after that. Reflecting today on the life of his mentor and mate, Mark Richards remembered Robbie Wood's success not only in surfing, but also surf lifesaving, for which he won both national and state titles. He was one of those guys that was, you know, as well as being a great surfer, he was very, very successful in business and everything he touched seemed to turn to gold. 
Succumbing to a long illness, Robbie Wood died at the weekend at his Gold Coast home surrounded by family, including his surfing champion son, Nicky. He was 62. They just donate the blood and never really see a f where it goes, who gets it. It's just a real faceless donation. Whether it's good or bad news, Steve Simpson never gets too carried away. While disappointed to be braced up for the next month, he simply dealt with the realities of a serious knee injury. I drive a manual car, my wife drives a manual car, and most of my family are the same, so I've got to try and get an auto, mate, and uh, try and make my way to physio and training. Scans on Thursday will help provide a more accurate assessment of the ligament tear, but six to eight weeks out is shaping as the likely scenario. It's disappointing, but... Um, I don't know, it's just one of those things you just got to get back and a bit of a test of your character, I think. Scott Duro passed a big test before a ball was even kicked at the weekend, keeping mum most of the week about his late inclusion into the starting side against Canberra. He kept a little secret there for a couple of days. didn't even tell me mum, so she didn't even know. She was a bit filthy. But proud all the same, he got to play his first top-grade match on home soil alongside childhood mate Jared Marlin. Yeah, it was special to play with him. We had dreamt about it when we were kids and that playing together in first grade and to actually make it happen, it was just, yeah, it was special. The selection puzzle this week centres more on the pack with the absence of Simpson. Coach Brian Smith, though, has more than a few options with Richard Fayoso and utility Chris Bailey among those in the mix, while Cameron Seraldo impressed in the lower grade match at the weekend. Jim Callinan, NBN News. The reason is quite simple. I think I have uh, six, seven players, strikers for that position, and uh, yeah, then you always have to leave one, two, or three at home. In deep training for the biggest endurance triathlon event in Australia, yesterday's hit out of Newcastle was more like a sprint for Nathan Stewart, albeit a tough one. Happy to have made it three wins in a row, he faces another tough week of heavy training before tapering for the biggest race of the year. We'll see how we go in three weeks at Port, mate. That's, that's the big one. Um, you know, it's nice to win those things, but yeah, that's the one I want to do well in. Newcastle Volleyball Club, the Forum, was the best placed local team at the opening round of the State Cup at the weekend. They were beaten in the bronze playoff by University of Technology Sydney, two sets to love. The build-up to the NBN Football League continues with the pre-season President's Cup competition. In a sometimes spiteful match, Azuri escaped with a 1-0 win over Toronto, care of a late goal. And back to league briefly with the Group 21 representative team announced today with Scone and Singleton players dominating the side to be coached by Aaron Watts. The team will play three trial matches before they start their campaign for the CRL Centenary Trophy against Group 10 at Orange on May 10.
It's one of the grandest old buildings in Newcastle, but at the hands of its international businessman owner, it's a boarded-up disgrace. Since buying the century-old building four years ago, Van New International has won all the required approvals to convert the GPO into an upmarket hotel. But now the company says the crackdown on late-night opening hours may make the project unviable. That's fired up Lord Mayor John Tate, who says the site has become an eyesore. Look, they're always finding excuses. They've owned that very prominent building for a number of years and they keep saying they want to get it open and get it running. They've had all the approvals and they've done nothing. Newcastle MP Jodie McKay says she's been trying to stop the owner from walking away from the plan. This post office should never have been sold to a developer, but it has. And six years later it's now boarded up and we need to work with him, not against him, to make this happen. The owner says work is almost ready to start on the site, but will now have to evaluate the likely impacts a cut in trading hours would have. What I'd say to them is either get the thing going or put it on the market and give it to someone who can do something with the building. Paul Lobb, NBN News. For 22 years, the homage to steam has been Maitland's tourism drawcard during Heritage Month. Trains to traction engines attract up to 80,000 visitors over one weekend in April. But a lack of cash to stoke the event has organisers seriously worried about the long-term future. I believe if there was going to be a last steam fest, we'll have to advertise it that way. So there will be an event in 2009, um, but from then on is what I'm concerned about and trying to secure the future of now. Steamfest may have reached the pinnacle of event success with inclusion in the State Tourism Hall of Fame, but the costs of maintaining the standard have risen with that success. The event's at the stage now to keep new things coming into it all the time, uh, which is what has made it successful. Um, we need to have an injection of funds from you know, either a community or a corporate sponsor. Trimming the event's budget and refocusing it around the railway station precinct are options being considered to ensure Steamfest survival. Peter Garnham is also determined to keep the event affordable. I'm still trying, and I know that our tourism operators in council are also still trying so that we don't take it out of the reach of the average family. Gary Blair, NBN News. Eight weeks out from the federal budget and it appears any hope of reducing New England highway traffic through Maitland is fading fast. The National Party has now added to the ongoing speculation that the Seahampton to Brankston F3 extension will be scrapped by the Rudd government, claiming it won't be in the budget papers on May 13. The rumours have Maitland's mayor demanding answers. We need some guidance but we also need some answers and uh, this has gone on just a little bit too long that we need an answer now. Failure to deliver the long-awaited road infrastructure is cause for concern because development and residential growth has been allowed by Hunter Valley Councils and more is expected based on the expectation that the F3 link would eventually be built. Peter Blackmore argues if the link is to be scrapped, the federal and state governments must act quickly to address the region's existing road problems. Look at other alternative roads and routes that we can get some relief. And if it is a cheaper option that's there, one that can be afforded both state and federally, let's work towards that. Gary Blair, NBN News. If annoyed, Boat Harbour residents and Port Stephens Council agree on one thing, this is a heavy-handed tactic. How dare they do that to our community and how dare they do it without consulting with us? The containers were lowered into place on Friday after 20 Banksia trees were cut down by vandals. If there's a significant um, tree removal that we will take, um, you know, the, the strength uh, of action that we have taken. Council says the containers will remain until new plants mature and that could take anywhere up to three years.
There will be fencing placed around the containers. Uh, they are bolted together and there will be signage as well. There is another issue at play here and that's been the running battle between residents and council about the condition of the site. Locals say it's overrun with weeds, however they've been told not to tend to it. It is not a garden, it is a reserve um, and shouldn't be treated as that. We, we don't have a lot of natural bush as, as it is and we should preserve as much as we can. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. This bathroom furniture manufacturer is a power thirsty business. All the more reason to become energy efficient. Two years ago, Greg Miles and his staff took long hard looks at how they do business and since that time, output has increased as has income and all because they've gone green. Productivity equals profit and uh, but also equals a lot of reduction in waste, electricity, gas and, uh, and landfill. They recycle cardboard, use paint sparingly through new practices and machines stay on only when they have to. And the workers aren't complaining. You see, most of the changes were brought about by them. We run a, uh, a competition out in the factory, so the best idea of the month gets cash rewards. Outside, the factory harvests its own water, while the routes taken by its fleet have been adjusted to go against the traffic, hence keeping fuel costs down. Once you really start to add up those figures, it's good business. They also intend to participate in Earth Hour on the 29th of March when electrical items will be switched off for one hour, and everyone can do that. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. Had you questioned Josh Perry at the time he left Newcastle, the big forward could barely disguise his displeasure. Part of the high-profile player purge, these days it's his level of diplomacy that's easy to spot. That's in my past now and I left there and I had a great time in Newcastle and I'm having a great time here, so yeah, that's in the past, mate. I've got no grudges or anything like that. That's despite comments directed at his previous coach, Brian Smith, during the pre-season. However, Perry did his best to avoid further acrimony today. <laughs> that was a tough year. That's all I was saying. He's already made a mark at Manly. His hit on Ben Ross, enough to literally spill blood for his new club. It's what awaits against his old team this weekend he's keen to see. I dare say we're getting a few boos, not the cheers that I'm used to, but um, I'm looking forward to that and uh, I just can't wait to get out there on Saturday. Wanting to treat it like any other game, you'd think that will be hard to do this week. Jim Callanan, NBN News. While he's soaked up the advice from the club's greatest halfback in Andrew Johns, you couldn't blame Scott Giroux for modelling his game on Matt Alford. Similar in stature, the manly half has built a career out of defying critics over his size. He's just a little tough bloke who gets in there and rips and tears and you know, if one day I could play like him, uh, I think I'd be pretty happy with that. Juro knows his progression will be a week-by-week -week process but he's in for a fair tutorial off for this weekend. Good old-fashioned pride, his main motivation though in this meeting. Give me a spanking on me debut, so it'll uh, be nice to get some revenge on him this time. With Steve Simpson out injured, Cameron Seraldo is in line to make his club first grade debut in a new look back row. The final 17, though, won't be made clear until later in the week. Newcastle Jets fans need not be fooled. Yes, Stuart Mashalik was back at training with Newcastle today, but it's only until the end of the month. Technically, he's still employed by the Jets, despite having signed with Sydney FC last week, but he's happy to fulfil his commitments. It's pretty handy for me because I've got, got fitness testing at the end of the month with the Oli Roos down in Canberra, so you know, uh, I need to be doing uh, some sort of training until then anyway. That's his first mission, to earn his spot back in the national under-23 squad. He must serve a one-match ban after preferring to celebrate the Jets' A-League grand final win than play in the recent Oli Roos match against Mexico. It was very unprofessional of me and uh, you know, something I'll, I'll definitely never do again. Because you know, I, I did let the boys down and, and Arnie and that, so I have to, have to work doubly as hard now to try and make up for it and get back in the team. 
Meanwhile, the Jets are still chasing the signature of Ruben Zadkovic, despite the Oli Roo agreeing to terms to play with Newcastle two weeks ago. It's understood certain clauses in the deal remain a sticking point. No dramas for Matilda Katie Gill, who signed to play professionally in Sweden. The striker will join AIK Stockholm by the end of the week on a three-month deal, with the expectation it will extend for the season. She remains available for Australian duty and will tour America with the Matildas in late April. It's not just motorists feeling pain at the pump. There is now a daily battle at the Bowser for service station operators as petrol pirates fill up without paying, ripping off the servos. Some service stations are up to twenty and $30,000 a year. Sometimes the smaller ones are a little bit less, but it's a problem everywhere. And it's getting worse, prompting police and the Service Station Association to hold a forum at Lake Macquarie to help prevent the crime. In the past year, there have been 11,500 reported petrol drive-offs in New South Wales. That's up 7% on the previous year. And it's not only hurting the owners and frustrating staff, but it affects the whole community. Because in the end, it's actually costing us all money. No business can operate just on an island on their own, losing money without having to pass that cost on. Service station operators were told that compulsory prepayment is the best solution and there's evidence from Sydney and overseas that it eliminates the problem. Pay before your pump is a simple common sense no-brainer in my view. Uh, it's uh, something that happens in the United States. According to the Bureau of Crime Statistics, every 10 cent increase in the price of a litre of petrol generates another 120 incidents of petrol theft per month in New South Wales. And so with a price spike expected for Easter, things don't bode well for our servos. As petrol prices increase, uh, then the temptation, the motivation will be there for more drive-offs. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. After almost eight years and 400 market days, the Honeysuckle Markets is set to close in a fortnight, forced to move out of the former railway sheds to make way for the new regional museum. As yet, a new location hasn't been found. But Newcastle Councillor Keith Parsons stepped in at last night's council meeting with a motion to ensure something is done. Council um, and the Honeysuckle Development Corporation and the management of the markets uh, get their heads together to see if there's, not, if there's some way that we can keep the markets in the vicinity of Honeysuckle after the um, museum construction begins. Market operator Carolyn Scott says there are three alternative locations right under the council's nose. One is the Break Block Park, just opposite the railway sheds. Then there's the sail awnings attached to the outside of the sheds themselves. Another is the boardwalk over on the foreshore. She says despite the market's success, they've never been taken seriously by the council, but she's welcomed the latest commitment. Whether it translates into a bureaucratic commitment, um, I await to be surprised, and I'm very happy to be surprised. Wouldn't it be fantastic to have a solution? Paul Lobb, NBN News. The clouds were bathed in colour by the rising sun. There were the usual comings and goings, but this was a special morning at Merriweather Beach. 
As dawn broke, the sand filled up with generations of surfers. They were there to celebrate the life of a local legend, Robbie Wood. Pretty much grew up idolising him, you know, he was one of the best big wave surfers in Newcastle and one of the, one of the greatest surfers that sort of come out of the Newcastle area. Um, you know, I used to go surfing with him sort of on the weekends. More than 70 board riders paddled out for a Hawaiian farewell to their friend who died on the Gold Coast at the weekend following a long battle with leukaemia. Usually waves at Merriweather come at a premium, but today everyone was happy to share. It's an ocean Robbie Wood helped instil in these waters, forging a bond between rival surfers and surf lifesavers back in the 60s and 70s. We used to call them seals in those days because they used to come down at the weekends on a Sunday and take over the beach and, and it used to get up everybody's nose about that. And, and it took a long time to break those barriers down. Um, Robbie Boone, sort of an Ironman champion, sort of really smashed it down. A founding father of the Merriweather Surfboard Club, Robbie leaves behind his wife Judy, surfing champion son Nicky, pop singer daughter Tiffany and Cassandra and Rochelle. Jessica Phyllis, NBN News. After two years as local league boss, Jamie O'Connor says he wants to spend less time behind a laptop and more of it developing the code. So being offered the new role of Country Rugby League Regional Manager provided a welcome change. When you're in the middle of it and the day-to-day -day, uh, administration comes up, it makes it difficult to see the bigger picture. I think this role is going to allow me to do that. He'll still be based in Newcastle, most probably in the same building. His first item of business is to make sure the region's 8,500 juniors filter through the code to senior teams. As for who'll replace him, he says keeping clubs like Curry going and resurrecting Maitland should be their first priority. We need to find uh, some solutions there and ensure that they're back on the park um, you know, securely in 2009 and, and can sustain that beyond that. Adam McKilrick, NBN News. The sun sets on the domestic athletic season this weekend, but there's no holiday for Laura Whaler. She does, however, have plenty to look forward to, today named in a new National Development Relay Squad to race at the Osaka Grand Prix in May. I've done, I've had a lot of goals and I'm able to mark them all off this year with a PB and some placings and some wins, so I'm really happy going into next season. That personal best of 11.79 seconds came last weekend when the 20-year-old from Head and Greeter was crowned national under-23 champion over 100 metres. This weekend at Stall, Whaler could potentially end up racing against her stablemates, including Bianca Williams and Trisha Greaves, with the latter heavily handicapped, along with Keith Sheehy in the men's, who will also start further back. It's a bit hit and miss, you're not really sure how you're going to go, because um, myself being an amateur runner, sort of my times are very exposed. He's still an outside chance for the Beijing relay team, but for the rest of the squad, the season comes down to Stall. For Brad Peters, 120 metres is his pet distance and nearly enjoyed a pro race trifecta, if not for the Bay Sheffield in Adelaide. Second there by 0 .001, so she was a pretty close one. And uh, first at Maryborough, uh, which was the 1st of January this year. Spencer Cox will race for the first time at Stall while Tom Scott returns to competition after an injury-plagued season. I missed a lot of training and missed a lot of speed work, but i am got over those now and I'm running pretty well. I believe we've got three good chances in our squad, uh, not only the guys but the girls and if, um, I'd be disappointed if we didn't make the finals, if not win one. Adam McKilrick, NBN News.
The licensing court made the decision late this afternoon, just hours before the laws were due to be introduced, saying the licensees didn't show good reason in their application for the stay. On reviewing evidence from licensees and police, the court said it would be adverse to the public interest if the three-month trial of a 3am curfew and 1am lockout did not take place. The Lord Mayor says he's not surprised by the result, but the last-minute timing of the decision will make planning, particularly in regards to transport, difficult. Now that's very short notice, but I believe the uh, bus operators and train operators are ready to respond to modifying their timetables. He is calling on everybody, especially patrons, to be patient during the changeover period. I'd ask people to be patient and understanding. The community is going through a, a very strong and, de and a debate that is really focused on what our community stands for and we, the only way we're going to get through this is to work together collectively and understand everybody's needs. The appeal will still be heard, the matter adjourned until March 31st. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. Newcastle men are dying from prostate cancer at a rate 40% higher than men in Sydney and they're also being diagnosed more often. The Prostate Survival Alliance Group says the statistics reflect the lack of free and independent information in the hunter. I've seen examples where people have been, if you like, bundled into touch to have an operation where it wasn't necessary um, or to uh, have one type of a procedure against another where where another may have been better. The Newcastle Prostate Cancer Centre, to be established at the old Waratah Post Office, aims to address this deficiency. They're given a lot of information, things like the grade and the sensitivity and the type of their cancer and how far it's spread and a whole range of things that swim around in their heads a bit. Uh, and they'll be able to come in here and see what it all means. It's the sort of service Keith Stewart was looking for when he was diagnosed with the disease. Without some surgeon trying to sell you surgery or somebody else trying to sell you theirs, just independent advice is very important. It's one of the things I noticed was missing. The centre will also house two international research projects into prostate cancer. It's expected to be open by June. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. Water safety has been made a priority by police this Easter and they're ready to check boats, safety gear and random breath tests to anyone lucky enough to be on the water. A lot of people don't use their vessels over uh, for extended periods of time and some of their safety gear may be depleted. Two jet skis have been sent from Sydney to patrol Lake Macquarie, Port Stephens and Newcastle. New South Wales Maritime is trialling web cameras at Shoal Bay and the entrance to Newcastle Harbour, allowing skippers to check bar conditions and weather forecasts online. On the roads, every available officer will be rostered on to crack down on the fatal four. Speeding, alcohol related driving, uh, drink driving, seatbelt wearing and also not wearing of helmets. 
Double demerit points come into effect tonight and police are urging drivers to take breaks at roadside reviver stops. They're there for your benefit to um, help you stop, revive and survive. Lucy Wilson, NBN News. The famous 1997 grand final and somewhere in the crowd was a young Cameron Serraldo. He was cheering for Newcastle, of course. Everyone has two teams, don't they? Whoever they go for and whoever's playing Manly. It's a long-running rivalry that will be just as passionate come Saturday night at Energy Australia and the long-limbed lad can't wait to get amongst it. One man's loss is another's gain and Steve Simpson's injury opens the door for what will be Serraldo's first grade debut in the red and blue. Last week, I just um, when the boys were running out, I was that jealous, like, seeing, I think there was 70,000 there, I turned around and someone said it was a small crowd. While a lot of focus will be on the clash of the forwards, there'll be plenty of pressure on Newcastle's young halves, who received some last-minute tips today from one of the game's best. Off-season barbs fired by night come Sea Eagle Josh Perry have added fuel to the fire, but Kirk Gilley's only looking forward to taking on his former flatmate. Josh is pretty outspoken at times, I guess, but um, that's him. And, uh, you know, I, I probably won't come across him too much in the game, but if I do, there'll be a couple of whispers in the ear. Jessica Phyllis, NBN News. At 15, he was breaking records set by Ian Thorpe, so it's no surprise Tom Fraser Holmes made the cut for the upcoming Olympic team trials. It can't be easy, juggling high school, a love for competing with his manly mates at surf carnivals and a blossoming swimming career, but somehow the 16-year-old manages, and manages well. last six months I've been doing probably 70k weeks and last two weeks been just dropping it down the kilometres each week from 60 to 50 to 40. Fraser Holmes will take on the 2 and 1500 metre freestyle and 2 and 400 individual medley at the Beijing Trials and he'll be keeping in mind the advice of another homegrown hunter champion, Olympic bronze medalist Justin Norris, who was once his training partner. There's a new back to breast turn and he taught me so much on that and just how to prepare mentally and physically for the events. The St Francis Xavier student says he'll be happy to swim good times and maybe make a final. If he keeps going at this pace, London in 2012 better watch out. Jessica Phyllis, NBN News. Council embarked on a reasonably modest redevelopment plan in 2004, but it's since blown out to a $37 million project, heavily criticised as being overly ambitious, especially considering Council's financial situation. 
It's a scheme that just blew out of control and uh, I think there's a recognition that we can't afford it and that we have other incredibly urgent priorities and that is the huge backlog log of infrastructure in this city. Council was going to put up $5 million for the original redevelopment plan with the remainder to come from the state and federal governments. It's now conceded achieving such a large grant is unlikely. I think they, they will attempt to dupe people into thinking it's because the state and the federal governments haven't come up with $30 million between them. That was never going to happen and to say it was would be dishonest. Council is expected to cancel the proposal and request the gallery's director look at other, more affordable alternatives, including a cafe and extra exhibition and storage space. It's unknown how much of ratepayers' money has already been spent on preliminary studies for the original redevelopment plan. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. New South Wales Police have called this year's Easter safety campaign Operation Tortoise, but traffic hasn't slowed on the Hunters' roads and neither have the drivers. 59 people have been caught speeding in the past 24 hours and police have carried out 717 breath tests. Among those, a 44-year-old Dungog man who returned a blood alcohol reading of 0.245, almost five times the legal limit. A bleak sky appeared over the hunter right on cue, but it didn't dampen spirits at a packed Belmont holiday park. It's all right. It's better than last year. <laughs> Poured yes, all the time. Good. The kids love it and all get out and just put our hoods on. It rains. Visitors travelled from as close as Warners Bay and as far north as Brisbane. Billy Nicolopoulos has been coming to the park with his family for 15 years. There's a whole bunch of kids, yeah, they all have a, have a ball. Plenty of time and space to wet a line, ride bikes and play cricket, but some came to reconnect. Lucy Wilson, NBN News. The cathedral is a wonderful place to work in. I've worked in it now for nearly 25 years and uh, to have to say goodbye to all the lovely things that are here, the beautiful music and all of that, that's sad. The happy side perhaps is maybe I get some more time to uh, smell the roses as they say. When someone close to us dies, life is never quite the same. And so when Jesus died on the cross on Good Friday afternoon, his family and friends were devastated by his death. And so with heavy hearts, two women went to his grave on Sunday morning. And much to their surprise, someone had opened the grave. And mysterious strangers in white robes told them that Jesus had risen from the dead. When they eventually met up with Jesus, their sadness was turned into great joy and their pain was turned into uh, delight that he was alive. And so the Easter message for us is that the risen Lord brings light and resurrection to our lives now and of course in the fullness of time. Well, many residents in the Hunter will be suffering under high interest rates and the spectre of inflation this Easter time, they'll actually be experiencing bad news rather than good news and they'll be facing stress and anxiety. But there is a larger economy than just the Australian economy or the world economy, it's God's economy and Easter is an expression of how God deals with the ultimate deflation, death, and inflates our hopes by the resurrection of Jesus. So this Easter, I'm hoping that people, despite the pain and stress they might be experiencing, will be able to see beyond that and gain the hope that comes through Easter, the raising of Jesus from the dead. I do wish you all a very happy and a very holy Easter, even in these times of stress.
Doctors have known for 40 years that premature males are weaker than premature females, but until now they had no idea why. The research, looking at babies born at 24 weeks to full term, reveals females are better able to regulate the flow in their small blood vessels, making them less susceptible to heart problems, a common cause of death in the first 72 hours after birth. I think this is one little step. Um, but it's in an area where we haven't really made much progress in many, many years. Researchers from Hunter New England Health and the University of Newcastle will use the information to tailor existing treatments and start looking for new ones. Can we maybe use them differently in boys than girls or earlier in boys or later in boys, um, treat, treating the sexes as a di a different in this situation um, to try and make the outcome for boys more like the outcome for girls. The next step in the ongoing research project is to find out why males have trouble regulating the small blood vessel flow. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. This is the first time Corey Patterson had even held an official NFL ball, let alone kicked one. But he didn't take much time to get used to it. Exactly what talent scout Paul Shepard was hoping for. Along with his Melbourne-based business partner, Shepard is targeting a range of sports for talented kickers to supply the lucrative American market. And Patterson has loomed large in their sights since watching his booming kickoffs for the Knights. Young, fit, can handle the big show and a naturally good kicker. Big is the word. From just a handful of attempts, Patterson punted the NFL ball almost 60 metres. While his place kicking bettered that effort in a display that will soon be viewed by NFL coaches. A base salary for the NFL is 330000 a year. Uh, Matt McBride with the Dallas Cowboys, the Australian guy, is on $2 million a year. Um, so there's some good dollars to be earned over there, that's yeah. for sure. That's the furthest thing from Patterson's mind for now, but he certainly isn't ruling anything out, considering AFL players like Ben Graham and Sav Ronka are the most recent high-profile Australians to land big money contracts in the US. You know, if, they, if I'm what they're looking for, and I guess you have to weigh up the option when it happens, I guess, but as I said, it's a massively long shot, and you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, I'll just, I'm happy to play footy for the night here. More kicks like this, and it could be... Indeed. Jim Callinan, NBN News. Coming from anything but a traditional AFL nursery, Craig Bird is living proof of where hard work and determination can lead. I was very lucky to have a pretty supportive family with my dad and that sort of thing and he got me into AFL so he's probably someone I probably owe this to. The 19-year-old earned a spot in Sydney's first round match on the back of an impressive pre-season with coach Paul Ruse viewing the Nielsen Bay lad as a long-term prospect for a team on the rebuild. But he's a pretty composed kid. I mean, he's a good inside, good inside player, but he's got some good pace and he can use the ball well and, and sort of good vision. So he's really the, you know, the, the sort of midfielder that we're looking for. And if making his debut isn't enough to contemplate, Bird has been handed the club's famous number 14 jumper, which hasn't been worn since it was retired with inspirational captain Paul Kelly back in 2002. Obviously a massive honour to be given number 14. A lot of people say it'll be a lot of pressure, but um, I try not to think about it too much and just concentrate on my own game. The Swans are rank outsiders for the opening round encounter with at least one betting agency placing them at $3.30 outsiders, but not even the coach is sure what to expect from his new look outfit. A two-time Premiership winning player with Manly in the 1970s, Mal Reilly wouldn't have thought much could have topped that. Until 1997, of course, when he coached Newcastle to the title over his old club. It was a match at the heart of a rivalry which still burns today and really was at the coalface for much of it. The bitter battles were knock em down, drag em out style affairs which live large in memories today. Spud's elbow caught Chief and just knocked him, uh, 
knocked him cold. But uh, that's the kind of commitment that you need from a pack of forwards. That, and Chief was inspirational, you know, in leading that pack about. He's challenged the current Knights pack to follow that sort of lead against what will be a desperate Sea Eagles looking for their first points of the season. Um, I watched the game last week and and I wasn't over impressed, but uh, I know they've they've got one or two to come back. They do need to up their commitment. Adam McDougall and Danny Wicks are the only concerns on game eve for Newcastle. The bench forward missing the team's final training session with a virus, but he's expected to play in a game that really doesn't want to tip. I'm firmly sat on the fence on this one, just looking forward to an exciting game.